This is the Historical Society of Palm Beach County, which is housed in the old Palm Beach County Courthouse. The courthouse was built in 1916 in the neoclassic style. At the time, neoclassic was the preferred architectural style for government buildings. People thought that the ancient Greeks understood how to run a government, and by building government buildings in that ancient Greek style, the structure would convey a sense of strength and credibility. The Historical Society was formed in 1937 with the objective of collecting various artifacts and documents that represent the history of Palm Beach County dating back over 10,000 years. We found some fascinating stuff in the collection. Addison Meisner was the architect responsible for many of the most important buildings in the Palm Beaches. Apparently, he had a pet monkey named John Brown who wore this hat. Now, why a monkey would wear a hat is somewhat beyond my comprehension, but that is only one of thousands of things I am unable to comprehend. At one point, Marjorie Merriweather Post owned General Foods and was probably the wealthiest woman in America. She was also known for building Mar-a-Lago, which was subsequently owned by Donald Trump. In 1968, she commissioned a scale model of her yacht, the Sea Cloud. When the ship was originally constructed in 1931, it was the largest private yacht in the world and often moored in the Palm Beach Inlet. For decades, it was illegal to gamble in the state of Florida. But apparently that was not an issue for the members of Bradley's Beach Club in Palm Beach. For over 50 years, it had an illegal gambling casino. And this is the roulette wheel and table on which these illicit activities took place. you can visit a number of historic sites, including the Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse and the Du Bois Pioneer Home, which is built on an ancient Native American shell mound. And if you venture a little further inland, you may come into the natural habitat of my film crew. And if you do, it is important to remember not to feed them, because if you do feed them, they're going to want a nap. This is the federally designated Loxahatchee River Wild and Scenic Area. There was a Wild and Scenic Rivers Act that was passed by Congress back in 1968. And that gives these, these wilderness areas extra protection. The best place to start if you want to experience the Wild and Scenic portion is, is Palm Beach County's River Bend Park. When you come down here and, and you're in a canoe, when you're in a kayak, uh, you're going to be paddling next to ancient cypress trees. Uh, they're covering the river almost the whole way. It winds between these big cypress knees. And these river systems are so important because of the habitat that they provide. There are so many rare species that use these areas. Just really, really amazing experience being able to be here. You can see how steeply this goes up onto this shell mound. 
Benji also took me to see the Du Bois house, which was built by one of the earliest settlers to the area. And it was built on a shell mound. So a shell mound is kind of a, a architectural formation that the Native Americans here in Florida would build. Uh, and, you know, the higher ups in the group in, in the tribe would be on top of the shell mound. The village would be around the outside of the shell mound. So we're up on the mound. Right, right. But it was much higher in those days. So not a whole lot higher, it was just much bigger. It spanned a lot greater distance. How so far we're did gonna, it go? Um, it, it went behind us another probably 200 yards. And so the only part that is left is where the homestead here is of the Du Bois house. They actually excavated two thirds of the mound to use as fill to build a city that's a little further south of here, Lake Park. So here you can see why we know that this mound is made of oysters. And so what these are, are pottery shards. And these potentially about 2,000 years old. I'll take these, we have our archeologist here. I'll hand these over to him and he'll catalog these as surface finds and they'll study these and, and find out as much as they can about these shards of pottery. Benji also brought along a group of ancient artifacts from the area. What they had a lot of was shark's teeth. You see the, the hole that is drilled right in the center of this shark's tooth. So that signifies that it could have been used in a variety of ways. Uh, it could have been used as jewelry, but it also was used in weaponry. Uh, this would be used in place of a point, so as an arrowhead. This is a piece of, of a large native shell, probably a large queen conch. And you can see some modification here on the end. And so this would be held and used as a scraping tool, a shaping tool, uh, probably a carving tool to create dugout canoes. These are vertebrae. And they're vertebrae from about a 20 foot long hammerhead shark. It shows that the Native Americans here, the, the Yegas, were hunting very large game. But the real significance is this was not found on the top of the mound. And so this is some of the very early representation of communal eating. So killing large game and then sharing it uh, throughout the tribe. out in the Florida sunshine, some will sit in the private suites, and some will sit in the party areas. I actually have a rather personal relationship with baseball. My grandfather had a small dry cleaning store about a block away from the Yankee Stadium, and one of his jobs was to clean the uniforms of the Yankee players. When Mickey Mantle or Joe DiMaggio came onto the field in their crisp, clean uniforms, it was the result of my grandfather's skill and dedication to his craft. My favorite period in the history of American baseball ran from 1900 to 1919 and was known as the dead ball period. In those days, the cost of a professional baseball was about 100 bucks in today's money. So the guys who owned the teams tried to use the same ball throughout the entire game. Problem was that by midway in the game, the ball was pretty much misshapen from being hit with the bat, and it was covered with mud and tobacco juice. The teams had security guards who retrieved balls that were hit into the stands. Home runs were unusual. The game featured bunts, stolen bases, hit and run plays, and some questionable pitching tactics. The scuffs on the ball fostered the development of spitballs, shine balls, knuckle balls, and other deceits that produced an unnatural flight path for the ball. The dead ball period came to an end when a rule change in 1920 required the umpires to put a new ball in play whenever the old ball was scuffed. The new and livelier balls favored the long ball hitter like Babe Ruth. 
The modern stadium is designed to promote the home run hitter. The babe would have loved this place. The Boca Raton Museum of Art was founded by artists rather than philanthropists, which is rather unusual. The sculpture garden presents life-size figurative works, large-scale abstract monuments, and one of Ricardo Illy's favorite sculptures, a tower of coffee cups. In front of the entrance is Marty's Cube, which is almost identical to the New York Astor Place Cube. However, neither Marty's nor the Astor Place Cube is related to Rubik's Cube or Ice Cube. There's a psychedelic mural by South Florida artist Jose Alvarez. There's a sculpture of a mangrove tree made with 85,000 crystals. They have a nearby art school that offers over 100 classes each week in different mediums. People who never thought that they could paint go there and discover their talent. As a matter of fact, my cousin Harold went there and found out that he was so good at copying famous paintings that he is now doing three to five for forgery. Next up was a visit to the Lion Country Safari Park near West Palm Beach. You drive through the park in your own car as long as it's not a convertible. As you drive along, you listen to a recorded narration that explains what you are seeing. In essence, you are driving through a cageless zoo. As you drive along, you see giraffes, zebras, rhinoceroses, lions, chimpanzees, and an occasional retired federal official. Lion Country Safari has a large herd of schematar horned oryx which are extinct in the wild. As part of a species preservation program, they share animals with other zoos in order to breed them and keep up the population. The sharing program helps to diversify the DNA of the species. A similar program with the California condor at the Los Angeles Zoo resulted in the birds being released back into the wild and thriving. Of particular interest is the chimpanzee exhibit. They live on an island system where they move to a different island every day. It's similar to their natural nomadic lifestyle. Of course, a key to their well-being, as it is for most travelers, is to pack lightly. In 1978, Alexander Dreyfus and a group of business leaders formed the Cultural Council of Palm Beach County. Its objective is to increase the cultural activities in the community and encourage professional artists. Surprisingly, cultural activities are a major part of the local tourist economy. During a single year, the tourists who come to Palm Beach to take part in the local cultural activities spend 300,000 nights here, create 11,000 jobs, and bring in millions and millions of dollars. Hey, where's my easel? Rena Blades is the president and CEO. She told me more about the council and took me on a tour of what was happening. Well, you know, we're in the galleries of the Cultural Council here in Lake Worth, and we're looking at an exhibition today of local artists who happen to be from Palm Beach Gardens, uh, which is one of our 38 municipalities in this very huge county. These, these are mostly paintings in this exhibition, but in the galleries we show sculpture, we show installation work, we've often done sound installation, um, and prints and photos and so forth. From abstract work to, you know, beautiful Florida landscapes with our gorgeous sable palms. One of the things I wanted to share with you is the history of this building. You know, it was built in 1940 as a movie theater in a streamlined, modern style that was popular in the Art Deco period of, of the early 40s. This architect uh, did nothing but build movie theaters all over Florida and Georgia, and so the building itself is really special. Today, we're an art center, and we do great stuff in this building.
So cultural tourism here is pursued at a much higher level than most of the rest of the state. We have more to do here in Palm Beach County than, uh, than most of the southeast. And we're blessed by these incredible art museums that have huge collections, professional theaters who hire their cast in New York and Chicago, and a zoo and a science museum and a history museum that really are the best, some of the best in the country. Fishing can be divided into three categories. Fishing because fish are an essential element in your diet and you need fish to survive. Fishing because it's the way you make a living. And fishing because it's your sport. And like most sports, sport fishing needs a clubhouse. And this is the West Palm Beach Fishing Club. And it's clubhouse. It was founded in 1934. It has about 1,400 members. Some are families that fish together. Some are kids that love the sport and want to learn about it. And some are seasoned pros that are in the game to win a tournament. Bert, the building was built actually after the club was formed in 1941. It took them a while to raise enough money to build the building. But the reason the building is here is because right across the street was the epicenter of the sport fishing fleet in the 1930s. That was the city marina. And so this was a logical place to build the building right across from where all the fishing action was taking place. The West Palm Beach Club was one of the first organizations of its kind to get involved in catch and release programs. The elders of the West Palm Beach Fishing Club came up with this idea of flying little red pennants to signify the number of sailfish that were released offshore during a day's outing, instead of bringing a bunch of dead fish back to the dock. And so it was still a way that the angler could kind of get bragging rights by displaying all these pennants, and it was obviously good for the fish. And so it's a, it's a, a conservation legacy that exists to this day and is recognized around the world for anybody that fishes for billfish. There's an annual silver sailfish derby which is the oldest continually running billfish release tournament in the world. Well, this is the world famous Mrs. Henry R. Ray Trophy. It's the oldest sailfish trophy in competitive fishing. And Mr. Ray, who sponsored the trophy starting in 1935, said, well, if we're gonna have a trophy that's named after my wife, it better be big, shiny, and elegant. Is that and true about his wife? That, <laughs> I don't know about his wife, but this is a very, very special award. It's highly coveted in the world of bill fishing. There's not another one like it. Even the old man of the sea, Ernest Hemingway, sponsored a derby. Tell me about some of the fishes that are up here. So a lot of the fish that are caught uh, in this area are represented in this room. So this is the original skin-mounted tarpon here, a really nice specimen that was caught locally. And you can see that that is a very, very old fish. And so many of these fish are very special uh, specimens of original skin-mounted fish, some of them dating back 60, 70 years. Today, when fish are mounted, they're, they're mostly fiberglass replicas. They're not the real fish. But many of the fish in this room are the real deal. It's really a fantastic museum, this old building, and uh, worthy of the designation of being on the National Register of Historic Places. You convinced me. And if you're in the neighborhood, stop in. There is usually somebody around who would be happy to explain the history of saltwater sports fishing and tell you about this huge fish that they let get away. Big game fishing is considered a recreational sport, mostly by the people doing the fishing, less so by the fish. It was founded in 1898 by Frederick Holder, a marine biologist and early conservationist. Special boats built for game fishing appeared in the early 20th century. They featured a deep cockpit, a chair fitted for landing big fish, and leather pockets to hold the fishing poles. The Palm Beaches area in Florida was one of the earliest centers for big game fishing, and it's still one of the world's leading destinations for sports fishing. The warm Gulf Stream that runs up along the east coast of Florida is home to many of the big fish, including sailfish, tuna, marlin, swordfish, and shark. 
As the stream passes the Palm Beaches area, it comes closer to the shore, so fishing boats can quickly reach the fish. The cost of a fully equipped big game fishing boat can be considerable. The boat itself, the tackle, the mooring fees, the insurance, the maintenance, the expert captain, and the beer coolers, which is why many people prefer to charter their big game boat. And the Palm Beaches has one of the world's biggest sport fishing charter fleets. There's also another new style of getting offshore that appealed to me as well. It's called luxury fishing and cruising, and the vessel is appropriately equipped for the task. We boarded a boat called the Gallant Crew in Lake Worth and got underway. Captain Kevin Gallant explained the concept. When the tide comes in, it brings with it crystal clear water comparable to the Bahamas. So you can be boating in 20, 30 feet of water, look down and you can see the bottom, see whatever's down there. It's, uh, it, it really is like being on one of the Caribbean islands. It's just primarily two different types of fishing we can do offshore. One is bottom fishing, or we can troll with uh, ballyhoo or drift with live bait and go for more sport fish. Cheers. Champagne, anyone? You just sunk a sub. You can cruise the intercoastal waterway and take in the sights. Enjoy a glass of champagne and relax. Or head off shore in search of a large fish. Just take long. And then I just reel them in. Yeah, just like that. There you go. Whoa! We're going to need a bigger boat. Proof positive of my deep sea oh, yeah. fishing like skills. It's up down. Down. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, that's a look at the history of the beach vacation and what's happening in the Palm Beaches. I hope you will join us next time as we travel around the world trying to figure out what is going on and why. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. Ah, uh, but wait, there's more. Whenever we edit one of our programs, we always end up with more good material than we can fit in. Interviews, stories, recipes. So we decided to put them on our website, BertWolf.com. Mm -hmm.